I've been gone a, gone a few weeks. Uh, uh, Lisa and I uh, were so privileged to do a trip in following the footsteps of Paul in Greece. The highlight for us, if you've ever read the book of Philippians, we were in the city of Philippi and we went to the stream where Paul baptized the first converts and we baptized some people from CCV. It was really, really cool. Uh, and then we uh, had uh, time with our family hiking uh, on vacation, that was great. And I was looking so forward to seeing you guys. Um, and then last, yesterday happened. And I, I just want to say this. Um, we are told in First Timothy chapter 2, we're to pray for our leaders. And disciples of Jesus are to be known as people who are apolitical. You can have political beliefs, um, and you should, and be very involved in politics, but the higher priority is people and the kingdom of God. And so it was just so, we're so jaded by politics and everything that, like my first, my, I'm, I'm so ashamed of myself, my first thought wasn't, oh, that's a former president. Like, he's a dad, he's a husband, he's a brother, that sort of thing. You know, I'm immediately thinking, how's this party going to spin this, and how's this going to spin this, and that sort of thing. And it's, we need to be the people that are known uh, for putting people first and for being disciples of Jesus. So, what we want to do is we want to pray right now as we're commanded. And uh, so, let's just bow our heads and we're going to pray. Uh, God, we are so thankful that um, the life of the former President Trump was spared. Uh, we pray for the family of the man that was killed. We're so thankful for the Secret Service. God is disciples of Jesus. We also pray for the family of the shooter. We pray that they would find hope and encouragement in you in this situation. We pray, God, that as disciples of Jesus, that we could be people that are bridge makers and peacemakers wherever we are, especially online. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're starting a new series today on the book of James. And I am so excited because as a Christian, no doubt you've heard that the book of James is the most practical book in the New Testament. And you are going to find through this series that, yes, it's practical, but the book of James is the most prophetic book in the New Testament. Um, Amos 8.11 8, says this, The days are coming, declares the sovereign Lord, when I will send a famine through the land, not a famine of food and for thirst and water, but a famine for hearing the words of the Lord. And what we're going to be doing in this book of James is that we're going to be taking it at face value, and we're not going to try to turn it into an American self-help book, what we're going to allow the book of James to do is to be able to speak into our lives and bring the kind of change that Jesus would like to see. And so let me just read the beginning of the book of James, and I will show you how Christians get it wrong immediately. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, James is Jesus' brother. He calls himself a slave of the master Jesus. To the 12 tribes scattered among the nations, so he's speaking to Jewish Christians, greetings. And no doubt you've heard this, word, heard this verse. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kind, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. That's beautiful, isn't it? Like, look at the trials that you're going through as an opportunity to grow and to have joy and to become complete. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault. And it will be given to you. God will give you wisdom. But when you ask for wisdom, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. All right, so what does that mean? That means life is hard. We need to accept that difficult trials are going to come. 
And if we don't understand what God is doing, we ought to pray and God will give us wisdom, but we need to pray and believe. And we'll just have better lives because difficult trials come our way. That is not at all what James is saying. James is not saying that at all. All the American Christians want you to think that that's what James is saying. It's not true. So let's jump into it. It is true from the time we're born until today, life is hard. Life is difficult. I remember when I was in elementary school and I heard about this terrible disease. Now, I was, I'm a Gen Xer, so I don't know those of you who are younger, you experience this in gym class. But take a look at this video. I will never forget when this happened to us in gym class in elementary school. Take a look. All right, today we're gonna use gym class to test you for scoliosis. What is scoliosis? I will not explain that. Nurse to Cesare, who's only ever treated you guys for headaches, is gonna take you to the bathroom stall, have you take your shirts off, and then if she does find scoliosis, that's on you to tell your parents. If they find out we have it, what do we do? Yeah, is there any like follow-up? Nope, no, you're never gonna hear anything about this ever again. Why doesn't our doctor do this? Only school nurses are qualified to check for scoliosis. I feel like my doctor could easily take 30 seconds out of my physical and check for a curve. This is the one thing that school nurses have. Let's let them have this. And then once you're done being checked for your potentially debilitating spine disorder, we will resume our archery unit. Now, Ben. Oh, you got it. What's that mean for me? I don't know. <laughs> did, anybody, did anybody, did that happen in elementary school? Yes. 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 Learn very soon, right? That life is going to be hard. Life's going to be difficult. And uh, that, the thing is, it's, an, it's, it's true in a sense that God does say that God is going to work in our trials. But that's not what James is saying because people stop reading. If you continue reading in verse 4, it says, Believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position. What does that mean? But the rich should take pride in their humiliation, since they will pass away like a wildflower. For the sun rises with the scorching heat and withers the plant. Its blossom falls and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away even while they go about their business. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trials, having stood the test. That person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. So what is James saying now that you understand the full context? The book of James is written to people who are being persecuted for their Christian faith, and they're not being paid their wages by the people that are hiring them. They hire them for work, and then they say, no, well, maybe I'll have some money next day and next day. And, that's, and so it, it's a terrible, terrible thing that James is addressing. And then as he gets into the letter, he speaks to the heart of the people of, that are in this room. Now, who is this James? First, James thought Jesus was insane and shaming the family. James was Jesus's second younger brother. When Jesus left the family to go be the son of God, James was like, you can't do that. You're the oldest son. You're supposed to stay here and take care of mom and dad. You're supposed to take care of the family. But you're off being the son of God. I remember I was coaching soccer one time. I, 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 so I picked up my daughter, and there were a bunch of girls that needed a ride home. And one of the girls was, was talking about having a brother. Was, my daughters don't have a brother, right? They uh, they just have sisters, and uh, she, this girl was in the car talking about her brother, and she said, what I hate about my brother is beef stew. I'm like, what? Yeah, what he'll do is he'll chase me around the house saying I'm going to open up a can of beef stew, and then he'll get me on the ground and fart on me, and <laughs> I was like, that is the funniest thing I've ever heard. I'm going to open up a can of beef stew, but... What you have to understand is that James is like, Jesus, how many cans of beef stew did you open up on me, man? Like, seriously, and now you're the son of God going to be a rabbi? And so in one verse in chapter Mark, it says, Jesus entered a house, there was a crowd. When his family heard this, they tried to take charge of him. For they said, he's out of his mind. I mean, you would have too, right? The second thing that we know about James is he converted after Jesus's resurrection from the dead. Uh, we are, the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, for what I received, I pass on to you of first importance, 
Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. He was buried. He was raised on the third day. And this is the order in which Jesus appeared to people. He appeared to Cephas. Who's Cephas? Peter. Cephas is an Aramaic term. Peter. He appeared. To, why did he appear to Peter? All right. And then to the twelve. And then he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time. Most who are still alive. And then he appeared to James, his brother. Can you imagine, like, you make fun of your brother? He went to Jerusalem and made fun of Jesus in Jerusalem. It was like he was riding him the whole time. And then Jesus raises from the dead and appears to James. And suddenly, James then became the leader of the Jerusalem church in the early Christian movement. Those of you who come from a, a tradition where you honor Peter as the founder of the church it's in the leader of the early church is simply not true. James was the leader of the early church. Acts chapter 8, it says, on that great day, a persecution broke out against the church and everybody was scared, scattered. But James stayed. The apostle Paul, when he was converted, went to talk to James. So after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Cephas, and stayed there 15 days. I saw none of the other apostles. Only James. In fact when there was a dispute in Acts chapter 15. Who settled the dispute? James. They were arguing over something. And it says this in verse 13. When they finished. James spoke up. Brothers. And that settled the matter. So he was the leader of the early church. The brother of Jesus. And then we are told that James was killed by the order of the high priest. And so James served as the leader of the early church for 32 years. And the Jewish historian tells us the high priest assembled the Sanhedrin of the, of the judges, brought before them the brother of James, whose name was James and some others, for, and some of their companions. We had formed an accusation against them as breakers of the law. He delivered them to be stoned, and he was taken and pushed off the top of the temple. And when he landed, he didn't die. So someone took a club and smashed him over the head. That's Jesus' brother. Going from skeptic to leader to martyr. Now, many of you are like, or not many of you, but some of you, if you're like me, you coming into church and you're, skeptic of, you're a skeptic of all of this, we have even found James... Ossuary, which is a burial box, which was unique to the first century. I want you to look closely at this box right here. This is a burial box. What would happen in the first century is that you would bury your uh, loved ones in a cave. You would let their bodies desiccate, and then you would take the bones and you would put them in a box. This box, when it was, when it was discovered, had a writing on it. The inscription went from right to left from right here all the way over, and it's kind of hard to read, so I, I put this up here. Go to the next photo if you can. So it goes from right to left. Jacob, which is James. This is Bar. Jacob, Bar, Yosef, Jacob, son of Yosef, a, a brother of Yeshua, Jesus. James, son of Joseph, brother of Jesus. And it was in his last days where Jesus' brother, the skeptic turned leader turned martyr, sent a letter out to the church. And I want to talk about the wider implications for you and I today of what this letter means for us. While specifically it's addressing economic exploitation, it does have a larger application to all of us. And so I want to ask you, are you happy right now? Are you a happy person? Are you an optimistic person? Are you a hopeful person? Are you someone that can smile and laugh and enjoy life? And if not, why? No doubt the reason why is because you have gone through some very difficult things. 
And if someone knew your full story, they'd probably turn it into a movie about someone facing some tremendous pain. James speaks to all of us when he says this. James, slave of Jesus, of the Lord Jesus, of the Master Jesus Christ in Greek, to the 12 tribes among the nations, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kind. You haven't been subjected to a drawing lately? Let's go to the board, people. Here we go. James says, James says, there we go, all right. James says, here is you. And you have a not smile, you don't, you have a sad face on, right? Because there have been these potholes that you've gone through in the past. And they're very deep. And you know that at some point, there's going to be another hole. And then you're going to go a while, and then there's going to be another hole. And you're going to go a while, there's going to be another hole, and this is going to be a big hole. This is where the Eagles get to the Super Bowl, but they don't win again, that sort of thing, right? <laughs> so this is your life. And you have a choice of how you're going to view it. A realistic person or as someone with a sanguine personality. Is, well, really, anybody is going to look at this if they knew all the pain that was coming towards them, they'd have a smile or they'd have a frowny face on their face too, right? The problem is, is that there are two viewpoints on life. One is accurate, but miserable. One is accurate, but hopeful. Yes, there's going to be a miscarriage. Yes, there could potentially be a divorce. Yes, a loved one is going to die. Yes, you're going to have a sickness. Yes, you're going to have a financial situation. What James says may happen. And you can be accurate and negative about it, or you can see these potential things as opportunities, okay? So what I want to talk about today is, is I want to talk about the way that you view life and the way that your perspective on life is making you miserable, okay? So I want you to write this down. James is saying there are two perspectives on trials. One is, I'm going to try to put plywood over these holes. I'm going to make my life as problem-free as possible. And you should. You should work out. You should go to counseling. You should do all of these things. But how many of us know you can work out and you can go to counseling. You can do all the things and bad things are still going to happen, right? It's going to happen. So, one person tries to put plywood over the holes and avoid them. The other one says, I don't know why this is happening, but it's happening for my good. This is an opportunity for me. This difficulty is an opportunity. This difficulty is the best day of my life, and I know it. So I want you to write this down. Unhappy people are unhappy because they don't know how to find happiness in their boring and painful lives. They're constantly wanting to escape their lives. They're constantly trying to find peak experiences, as, as Abraham Maslow says. As uh, Blaise Pascal says, all of humanity's problems stem from man's inability to sit quietly in a room alone. We need someone out there to make us happy. I'm gonna constantly go from this new thing and this new relationship and this new church and this new job. I'm going to keep going to new, new, new because that thing is going to solve it for me. The two words that are found on the lips of unhappy people are always when and then. When my cancer is in remission, then I will be happy. When I am married, then I will be happy. When my divorce is finalized, then I will be happy. When I have children, then I'll be happy. When my children's behavior problems are fixed, then I will be happy. When I make enough money, 
then I'll be happy. When I retire, then I will be happy. Do you see what I'm talking about? So when and then are future-oriented words. And as Pascal says, since we are always planning how to be happy, it is inevitable that we should never be so. So back to my question. How many of you are like genuinely happy? Like all the time. It doesn't mean that there aren't moments of sadness. It doesn't mean there aren't moments of difficulty. But how many of you would point to you and say, now that is a gloomer and a doomer? Uh, so uh, when we were in Greece, um, it, it, was, it was just good. It was good just to be with a bunch of people for a long period of time. It's kind of like church camp for adults. And, um, and then I was sad. Like I, I was telling Lisa, as we were going to the airport, I, as we were leaving, I was like, are you sad? I was like, because I'm always sad at this point. I, I love these people. I want to be, you know, I'm so sad at this. And then we immediately go and we're with our family for a week and uh, our whole family's together, right? And then when we left, I'm so sad, right? And because you, and trust me, when your kids get older and they leave uh, and, and you're going to, when they can get them, get them to come back together, it's a special thing. So, so this past week on Monday, I'm in the yard sitting with my chickens. <laughs> Sheila, Always comes up and pecks at my ring. She always come up and peck at Lisa's toenail polish. And I just ask myself the question, can I be happy even when I shouldn't be happy? Can, is that possible for me? Like, I really, I do. I miss those relationships of being there. And of course, they're still in the church and that sort of thing. But, and then miss my kids and all that. And then, can I be happy if this is my life? Can I genuinely be content right now? Literally, if nothing else happened in your life, and this was your life for the rest of your life, can you be happy in that? James says, it's good that these trials come. I'm like, James, you're talking like a robot, right? Like, So what is the good that James says will happen? Here's here's the good. He says, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. What is that? Perseverance is the ability to stand up under things. You get hit with with a scoliosis test in elementary school, right? And then a girl breaks up with you in sixth grade if you're dating that, right? And then there's this happen and this happen and this. Every single time you go through a difficult time, it makes you a more grounded person. Here's a quiz. When you're hurting, who are the most encouraging people in your life? Is it the people who haven't gone through so much? Or is it the people who've been in a lot of pain? You know, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross says that pain creates beautiful people. Here's my question. If we, create, if we created a world and you were in charge of creating human beings that were whole and complete, what would you do to those human beings to make them whole and complete? What would you do? Would you give them a, a life of ease or would you give them your life? James is saying right off the bat, before we start talking about the ways to improve our lives, and we're going to get into relationships, we're going to get into all the things that James talks about, he's like, right off the bat, you have to be a person that can look suffering in the eye and see something good in it. I've told you this before, um, when our kids were small, whenever we would go out to eat, we played a game called, how long does dad give them? And how long does dad give them basically is... Um, dad would make a, uh, a guess on the burn rate of, of their cash flow and how, how long, what are they going to get out of business? And it all started when we went to a Chinese restaurant that has 6,000 square foot dining area. And I looked around and I said, oh, let me see. 22 employees, 6,000 square feet. He's probably paying this, this, and then there's the triple net. And they probably did a five year, 10 months. 
10 months and this place is out. And it was sooner, it was six months. Anybody that's ever been a Chinese food consumer knows, Chinese restaurants, 50% of their income is gonna come from takeout. You need a very, very small thing, maybe three tables. And it's all gonna be built on relationships. People do this at weddings too. And don't tell me you haven't done this at a wedding. The bride comes down, or the groom is up there, the bride comes down, and you're calculating. <laughs> My money's on four years. Three years, three, I'm, okay, maybe two, maybe two, right? Have you ever done that? Have you ever thought that? You're horrible. Why would you think that? That's terrible. You're all going to hell, all of you. James says that, right? But you do that. You do that with people. How many of you have seen someone start a new job at your company? And you're like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. This guy isn't even worth getting donuts for, right? This, he's gone, right? And how many of you have ever looked at new Christians that way? And you're like, nah. They're not going to make this. You can play the how long do I give them game with lots of different things. Music, ah, it's a one-hit wonder. Actors, yeah, he's going to have a, su a successful career. She won't. Cars, right? That's why they buy the 10-year warranty. It's a terrible car, right? And you can play that with people. But the fact is, how long will they stay a Christian? There's a simple formula. The difference between those who stay and those who bail is a switch in perspective. Moving from viewing our pain from how does it affect us to viewing how does it affect and how do I find meaning through the cross. The difference between those who stay and those who bail is a switch in perspective, moving from viewing our pain from how it affects us to how it finds meaning through the cross. It's all about the end result and the meaning, right? Um, lean over to the person next to you and have them point to the bones that they've broken before. Go. Here we are. Introverts, you're gonna love this. We do this every week at our church here. So lean over to the person next to you, point at the bone that's been broken. Broken. Can you do that? I've only broken one bone, and it's this. Can you see how it's curved? You see that? Sixth grade football. The week before the championship game, I'm the quarterback. My friend Eric is the running back and the wide receiver. I broke my finger. Did I tell my parents that I broke my finger so that they would take me to the doctor and put me in a cast? Of course I didn't. This was in the era where if the coach looked at you after concussion, how many fingers close enough? Get in there, right? And I did. I didn't I ever told anybody. I literally broke it. It went over like this because I knew we were going to go to the championship and we were going to win. And I could stand this. I'm not flipping people off. This is, my, this is a ring finger, right? I could go through this because of that. There have been some people here at CCV who have gotten a cancer diagnosis and man, you could look at that and just say, that's it. I'm dooming and glooming this thing. I'm gonna, I'm gonna play the victim. People are gonna feel sorry for me. How are you doing? Oh, this. I've seen people here get cancer and they see it through the cross. Going to cancer, going to the chemo treatments is an opportunity. How can that be an opportunity? It's an opportunity to build genuine relationships with people and talk to them about your faith. It is an opportunity to show to your family that you can be hit with one of the worst things in life and still have joy. This is not going to take my joy. I'm not going to let it take my joy, right? There have been some people here that are parents that have had difficulty with their kids. And, you know, it's, yeah, and, and life sucks. And those of you who are having a really, really good time with your kids, wait until eighth grade. It's wonderful. Um, it can be a challenge, right? And uh, those people that viewed this as an opportunity not to like pay 
I see people go through some really difficult things. And you, on one hand, you can't minimize how difficult it is. On the other hand, you have a choice of how you're going to respond. This is going to define me. This is going to end me. Or God is going to use this to help me grow and help me impact more people. I've seen that in parenting. I've seen that when people have lost their jobs. And I think it's going to be the same thing with you. James is saying, before we start talking about all the practical things in life, we have to shift your mindset. Things do not happen to you randomly. God is going to use them to do something. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, having stood the test. That person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let's pray. God, we're so incredibly thankful for a community where we support one another, especially in, in difficult times. God, our thinking can get so messed up. We can get in sync with the culture very, very quickly. And God, we pray that you would help us to view our lives through the lens of your son Jesus and what he did on the cross. Help us to be the people who can look at a difficult situation and be joyful but painful. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for watching today's message. Make sure to check out Brian's new book, Finding Favor, God's Blessings Beyond Health, Wealth, and Happiness. To sign up for Brian's newsletter, please go to Brian's website at brianjones.com.